This episode was sponsored by our patrons, Tam Zane Weir, Jessica Smith, Rachel Kay, Janelise Cannon, Jamie Lang, Jill Harrigan, Maria Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantelle Oliver, Ellie McDonald, Caitlin McTaggart, and Monique harris Pixado. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. On February 28th, 1728, hmm. a guy named William Byrd stopped at the Widow Allen's house in Surrey, Virginia which is just across the river from Jamestown, hmm. the Jamestown. Yeah. He was a surveyor, and he was surveying the land between North Carolina and Virginia, and he loved to stop and request hospitality at houses and then gripe about their failings as hosts in his <laughs> diary. Ah. <laughs> he was just going around condescendingly hating on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but the widow Allen was different. She earned his snobby stamp of approval. Mm. He said, now this lady, her worth is far above rubies. <laughs> <laughs> the widow Allen was Elizabeth Bray Allen, mistress of Bacon's Castle. Oh, I, I know Bacon's Castle. You do? Have you been there? No, but I've heard of it. It's one of the oldest houses in America. Yeah, we. I wanted to go there when we lived in North Carolina, but we did not have any money. You should have gone. It's very cool. Mm. Um, but the Widow Allen, more than so many other women that I have studied, she has inspired me to ponder how the past is a foreign country. Mm. Her world is so not my world, and I can't imagine how I would have reacted or lived had I been born in her role. I genuinely can't imagine. Huh. But she obeyed all the rules, and she was the ideal woman, according to the time. Mm. And it's got me wondering, if you check all the boxes, if you obey all the rules, where does that leave you? Usually not where you were told it would. <laughs> yeah. Come with me today to Surrey, Virginia. Beautiful countryside across the river from Jamestown. Gorgeous. And it's a county, incidentally, which is home to the world's tallest goat tower. Ah! <laughs> which I have witnessed wow. with my own eyes. Like a spiral, super tall tower with little holes. Spiral staircase inside for goats to climb up. Oh, oh I thought you just meant yep. like we have stacked the most goats on top of each other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would be even more impressive. But I want to see the goat tower. Spectacular. And, uh, but today we are visiting one of America's oldest houses, Elizabeth Allen's house, Bacon's Castle. Cool. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Okay, we are together. Oh, yeah, yeah. together. You're on a leash. You're leash. Okay. <laughs> I'm Carol Weedle. I'm the site coordinator here at Bacon's Castle in Surrey, Virginia. Okay. Well, welcome to Bacon's Castle. Like you guys heard, this is the oldest brick house in British North America. It's beautiful country. It's right across from Jamestown. Sometimes you think, you know, how did it ever get settled here? But we are just almost right across the river from Jamestown. And it was actually easier to travel by water yeah. um, at that time. So, and right next to us is Hog Island. That's where the Jamestown settlers kept their hogs. Gosh, what would it be like to live here? I know, it's pretty amazing, huh? Yeah, when we were pulling up the drive, all of us were just like, <gasps> <laughs> amazing. It's, like it's impressive. Of, yeah, it's like out of Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Elizabeth Allen lived at Bacon's Castle for 63 years, her entire adult life. Whoa. That's like the opposite of us who right. just move around. <laughs> I imagine if your whole life you lived in one house, what could that house tell yeah. about you after the fact? When this house was built, most people were living in a one-story wooden house, maybe the size of this room. So this was a mansion. She was the longest resident of the house. She lived into well into her 80s. She left a couple of inventories of what was in the house. She outlived three husbands and all her children. Oh. So the house 
is our biggest clue. So you can see original beams, original bricks and mortar. Um, this house is over 75% original fabric. Wow. It was lived in for over 300 years. And sometimes I think, you know, what do I have that's still going to be around in 350 years? You know, like nothing. The, uh, it's a Jacobean style house, and that was popular in England in the early 1600s. There are two rooms on the first floor, two rooms on the second floor, there's a third floor garret, and there's a full basement, so it's 5,300 square feet. Colonial women's lives were expected in the 1700s to follow a very clear path. You get married, you have children, you preserve the family wealth, mm. and that's it. That's what your life is about. If you fail at this, you have failed at life. <laughs> and in 18th century colonial Virginia, there was one very clear guide for how to be a good woman. And it was, of course, the Bible. Ah, I was going to say the Proverbs 31 woman. Oh my gosh, exactly. Mm -hmm. did, did you know I was about to bust that out? No, I was. that's the classic. I'm getting it out right here. <laughs> <laughs> because William Byrd, the traveler who loved to hate on everybody's hospitality, uh -huh. he tells us that Elizabeth Allen, quote, followed Solomon's complete housewife exactly. <laughs> wow. And that's the most vivid description of Elizabeth Allen we ever get. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I am busting out my old Proverbs 31 here. <laughs> Solomon's checklist for good housewifery. Let's measure our worth and see if it's far above rubies. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Give yourself a check every time you think you've achieved the point. Okay. <laughs> Number one, her husband has complete confidence and trust in her. Check. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Oh, well, mostly. <laughs> all the days, Olivia, all the days. Yeah. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. I buy clothes online. <laughs> <laughs> With eager with hands. eager hands. <laughs> you sewed so many masks I, during the pandemic. And I have sewed so many, yes. You sew things. and housewares. Yes, that's true. That's more than I do. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. Uh, again, I shop online. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. Absolutely not. I mean... Okay. What a failure. Yeah. What an utter failure. How about this? She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Mm, nope. I, I have a garden in the backyard. In I don't think that's the same as considering a field, buying it, and out of your own earnings, planting a vineyard. Fine. Lydia. I think you're stretching it. Fine. I dream of buying a field and planting a vineyard, <laughs> but I haven't done it yet. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. Yes, that part is true. <laughs> <laughs> she sees that her trading is profitable, and her lamp does not go out at night. No. <laughs> I like time <laughs> off. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Yes. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. I <gasps> I own a lot of purple. We are literally both wearing purple right now. See? Oh, mine is not fine linen. Yeah. And also I don't make coverings for my bed. Yeah. Oh, halfway there. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. I think my husband is unknown at the city gate, but he is respected among those to whom he is known. <laughs> the elders of the land? The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, no. That's funny because this is a way to measure a wife, but it has everything to do oh, with yeah. her husband. Cl like, right. Classic. Okay. Classic. Thanks, Solomon. Yeah. Cool. Okay. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. I have never made a sash. No, I have. For, what? what for? For Girl Scout badges for a friend's daughter. Wow. So, you check. are winning at biblical womanhood, mm -hmm. kind of. Kind of. I, I have like two checks. <laughs> she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. 
I like that one. Yeah, that's, yeah, I don't, I've never been so much big on the dignity part, so. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? She speaks with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. Obviously. I like that. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I love the bread of idleness. I definitely eat Big a lot fan. of bread of idleness. And I have no idea what's going on in my house. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one then? Her children arise and call her blessed. Yeah, waiting for that still. <laughs> they call me things. But... <laughs> <laughs> Solomon's conclusion is charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised mm. now we know I mean our biggest clue about Elizabeth Allen is that she checked all these boxes because William Byrd says she followed Solomon's complete housewife exactly mm. and what kind of character does that create imagine a woman who checks all of those boxes yeah. That's the question that we're going to explore. The most evidence that we have of her is as an old woman. So we'll begin there. I can see her very clearly in old age, and she is undoubtedly, to me, a character played by Maggie Smith. Hmm. All right. She dominated her house for 63 years, ruling over it in a Downton Abbey style Gracious ferocity. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go across the hall here and show you a Jacobean style interior. Mm. Ah, cool. This being a Jacobean interior, you notice the open beam ceiling, the diamond plane paned leaded glass windows, and the huge fireplace there. So these are the features that make this house Jacobean style. Outside, it's the cruciform shape, which you might have noticed when you came. The, the chimneys, triple chimneys on each end with curvilinear gables. We have probate inventories from this house. And so that really helps in our interpretation. We know what was in this room in 1711. So we know it was a multi-purpose room. We know there was a bed, but there was also a table with dishes. So this helps us know how the people lived at that time. This is a large house. There's a lot of space, but it's not a lot of separate rooms. Like you don't have a, a rec room and a sewing room and a reading room and a TV room, you know. You're going to sleep here. You're going to build a big fire in the fireplace. And you're going to eat some of your meals in here. Historians describe her as astute, formidable, intelligent, and strong-willed. These are the words they're using. So what I had in my mm. mind from the very beginning was... Maggie Smith, <laughs> ruling over her children and then her grandchildren. Maybe a hard life made her that way. Yeah. Ever since the 1700s, there have been ghostly sightings <laughs> at the house. Is she the lady in white? Mm. Is she the Bacon's Castle light? Or is she the white-gloved woman who plays with children? Hmm. To find out, let's roll it back to the beginning mm. and see how it all panned out for this grumpy, miserly old woman. She was born in Middle Plantation, 1692. Middle Plantation was a string of farms and plantations on a hilltop outside of Jamestown, and it proved to be a much more pleasant piece of real estate than swampy Jamestown. <laughs> um, one guy describes it as where clear and crystal springs burst from the champagne soil. <laughs> and Elizabeth's father was part of a new settlement in Middle Plantation that they called Utopia. Ooh. So Yeah, that that always goes well to name your stuff yes. that. <laughs> Not tempting the fates at all. And he built a fine brick house, which was really rare in those yeah. days. And it's a weirdly permanent choice to build a fine brick house back then. Mm. Her mother's name was Mourning 
as in like you go into mourning. Wow. But maybe they were seeking a utopia because in the decades before Elizabeth was born, the whole area around Jamestown was riddled with violence, so many factions mm. of different Native American tribes and immigrant groups vying for control. Mm. Brutal massacres were not uncommon. It was almost like a regular thing every decade or so. Hmm. And when she was seven years old, Middle Plantation became Virginia's new capital city. And they named it Williamsburg. Oh. And her family's like, ka -ching. <laughs> And when she was 19, her mother, Mourning, died. And by November of that year, she's married. So since this is 1711... We can guess that she had little or nothing to do with that decision. And she's married to Arthur Allen III, who owned a very large tobacco plantation on the other side of the James River. Hmm. The wedding was held in her father's fine house in Williamsburg. Elizabeth Ray Allen was married to Arthur Allen III. Arthur Allen I built the house. Then it passed to his son, Arthur Allen II, and then to Arthur Allen III and she was married to Arthur Allen III. And he brought her over here, and she thought this house was old-fashioned and outdated. But it was 50 years old by then, almost, you know. Okay. She had a lot of influence on the house. She did a lot of the renovations. She really changed it from the Jacobean style into more the Georgian style. And we'll be able to see that more when we go downstairs. Cool. So she could have slept in this bed chamber. The mattress is stuffed with, well, upper class people stuffed with feathers, lower class hay. But you can tighten up, if you want more support, you tighten, oh. tighten the ropes under your mattress. Sleep tight. Sleep tight. Oh. One of the, um, most photographed items of the house is that you can look all the way down the stair tower and see the first floor. Ooh. Ooh. This feels Georgian. Dif yeah. yeah. So this is where we're gonna see a little more of Elizabeth Allen's influence. So I mentioned already that she got married in 1711. And she came over here. She wanted the house to have an update. She had this very expensive paneling added, making the window seats. She made the fireplaces smaller. She plastered the ceilings, whitewashed the beams, and also changed out the windows. So it does have that more, um, it looks like Colonial Williamsburg if you've been through there, because yeah. now it's that time period. Yeah. So Elizabeth Allen is making these changes to the house. She and she is looking at her Proverbs 31 checklist. Get married, <laughs> check. Have children, check, check. She has a boy first, ah. named James. She's like, Success. nailed it. And then a girl, Catherine, hmm? nailing this 18th century womanhood. She's managing everything about the household. She looks at the old kitchen in the basement. We're actually going all the way down into the cellar. Ooh. Treads aren't very wide here. You can sort of turn your feet when you go down. All the way down, All the way down. Get down here. Ooh. I think this room was very hot with a blazing fire in that fireplace. It was very smoky. It was smelly, you know, there. It was a lot harder to do the cooking. You, you have to go in out and, and trap the rabbit or the squirrel. or So all the cooking and food preparations done here, but also all the food storage. So in those two rooms over there, and also on the front of the house, you've got your larder, all your dairy, your milk and cheese and butter is down here. Mm. Um, this is the wine cellar. Mm. This is the root cellar for everything that you're saving from your garden. You see how thick the walls are when you look at the windows. And she's like, nope. Heat rising is great in the winter. It's not so good in the summer. <laughs> so they built, they, there were at least two outdoor kitchens ah. in later years. 
She's checking those Proverbs boxes left and right. And then her father died and he left her a whole bunch of valuable land in Williamsburg. Hmm. And then her husband died two years later. So she's a widow at 35, Hmm. a very, very wealthy, landowning, free and independent woman. Hmm. In my mind, I'm like, you're set for life. Right. Carry on, Widow Allen. Just be free and powerful. Just do your yes, thing. Yes, but what would Solomon say about that? <laughs> so she marries again. Hmm. And in 1730, she married for the second time. She married Arthur Smith, who was from a wealthy family in Smithfield. But she marries with shrewd business acumen. Hmm. She thought that her estate was larger than his. She actually arranges a prenup. If he died before her, that she would get everything that she came into the marriage with, as well as a third of for her, each of her children and for her of his estate. It was very unusual. Yeah. I mean, the women are going to look up to her, mm-hmm. and hopefully the children did, to see that mom's looking out for me. You know, she probably grew into her belief system that... You know, I'm a woman, but I can still stand up and get what I think yeah. should be mine. Whereas we're not usually able to do that at 17 or 18 or mm-hmm. 20 or 30 right. or 40. <laughs> 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 some of us grow into it, some of us don't. Yeah. pause for a second for a message from us. Would you like to travel with us to the land of the road builder, Shkawil, the spirit, Shtabai, or the flower in the water, Zazil Ha? We are taking a what's-her-name Lost Women of the Yucatan tour this September. Gabriel Kame will be our guide, who is our guest on the Zazel Ha episode. We'll be having incredible experiences with the Maya, completely off the beaten track, biking through the rainforest, cooking traditional Mayan foods, swimming with sea turtles. It's going to be incredible. What's her name? Podcast.com and click on tours. We'd love to have you come along. Now she's Elizabeth Bray Allen Smith, and she has another son with Arthur Smith. Hmm. He was the playful caboose of the family. Hmm. He was Arthur Smith's pride and joy, his heir. But one fateful day, when he was 11, he died Hmm. in a swimming accident. Oh, no. And just a year or two later, maybe the same year, James, her eldest son, he died. Uh, Unknown cause. uh, uh, So what does that do to a mother? Especially one whose like whole purpose in life is mothering yeah. sons. She lost both her sons. Uh, Anger, fear, I mean, she checked all the boxes of wife and motherhood, and this is what she gets. Does she feel like she's being punished? Hmm. I'm really wondering, does she ever question the ethics of other aspects of her life? Hmm. Because surely somewhere, at some point, she would have at least encountered ideologies that were way more prominent in the North, but were well known everywhere, that owning other humans was irredeemably wrong. Hmm. And you know what else the Bible doesn't say, or maybe more accurately, is very internally inconsistent about? Mm. Whether or not you should set slaves free. Hmm. Yeah. The ideal housewife manages her property (laughs) with shrewdness and is never idle. And she ran a tobacco plantation. Does she think, does she ever think like, maybe I'm not doing the best, most ideal thing. Mm. She took her guide from society. They said, this is what you do. And she went, okay. And she did it well. She did it all exactly how they told her to do it. 
Okay, watch your step, and we're gonna go up and see the third floor, the garret. Yeah, she's, there's no way she's unaware yeah. of the idea that this could be wrong. Yeah, and so imagine living in that tension. Everybody around you is measuring your success in life by a certain code. Mm -hmm. You have to do that or you've failed at life. Mm. So this is called the garret. It is a combination of living space and storage space. It's probably the most original part of the house. Um, those are original floors in those rooms. There's probably even some original plaster up here. And this is where indentured servants and later enslaved people would have slept. Um, also, perhaps if you had a large family, some of the children might have been up here. But it was also storage. You know, the, the inventories tell us there were piles of fabric and, and tools and sacks of grain. So it was multi-purpose. It was definitely the least comfortable part of the house. It would have been really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter. So here's where I can see different forces at play in her life, different hegemonies that are determining her path for her. And my question is, where is love in any of this? Was there any? And that's one of the big questions among historians, all kinds of different opinions about what were family relationships like and what were people's emotional lives like in centuries past. But what we can see at play very strongly in her life is class. She is an upper class woman. It's going to take some kind of radical departure to not do that. Yeah. Or it's going to take like some extreme humility to accept that everybody around you is going to say you've failed and that you're a terrible woman yeah. if you don't do what they say. Right. Because it's not just everybody around you. It's God who yeah. sees you Ugh. as a failure if you don't do exactly. these things. Exactly. And the measure of a woman is, again, that preservation of wealth. Like, you do not fail your ancestors and your descendants by allowing the family wealth to shrink on your watch. Yeah, that's a, that's a heavy burden. <laughs> and one of the things that she does, which um, is really remarkable, in right in midlife, right before her first husband died, she established a school called the Smithfield School, a free school for poor children. Hmm. I think she was a generous woman. She thought about what she did with her money. She was concerned with people who weren't as well as off as her. She endowed a school in Smithfield for needier people. Her job is both to maintain and build wealth, but also give to the poor mm. in the right kinds of ways. She's absolutely doing that, and she seems to be really, really dedicated to it. Mm. Students could start at the age of 10. The boys took reading, writing, and arithmetic. The girls just reading and writing, and then they would be apprenticed to a woman who could teach them the family home arts, and the men, the boys would be apprenticed to uh, someone to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. um, so education must be important because she established the school. And then there's gender at play, that she's a woman whose job is to make money, but also to just be a hostess, a gracious hostess, and not appear to be the savvy business person. You just like secretly be the savvy business right. person. Yeah, so, you know, part of the time of Elizabeth also was entertaining and so this is the first, this room is furnished according to a 1755 inventory. And on this inventory, there was a Chinese export tea set. Huh. And so this would be where Elizabeth Allen would have invited you for tea. Whereas everything upstairs was very functional. Now there's, you know, there's decorative items, um, porcelain punch bowls, a lot of maps and prints. The style of the furniture has changed. It's, it's more decorative not so solid and functional. It's cool, you can picture her right here. You can. Up to age 80. I guess I imagine her as maybe sort of stern, strong and stern. Like I think you really would have to have a pretty good backbone, I think. <laughs> stood, stood up for what she believed yeah. in. and But then there's the softer side of her too that really took care of her family. I think, and not just her family, but saw other needs around her. So 
I see her as a compassionate woman. And then, of course, there's race. And this chapter of Jamestown story, the 16 and 1700s, mm. and that is just wild <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Nonstop madness. Yeah. Violence constantly. It's bananas. And that's the span of her life. Yeah. yeah. She's born in 1692. Wow. And throughout her life, race-based slavery is becoming entrenched. Yeah. It wasn't race-based for the whole of the 1600s. It was indentured servitude, and then after seven years, you become free, and you're given 50 acres of land. But about every decade or so, more laws are passed mm -hmm. that make sure that the lower classes will never unite against the elite. Because if you can convince your white indentured servants that it's not so bad, look, you could be black, you could yes. be in this worse, then, then they will accept what's happening instead of banding uh -huh. together and saying, no, we're just going to leave all the time. Exactly. The possibility that the lower classes could unite and stage a full-on rebellion mm. was so real in Jamestown and in Elizabeth Allen's own house. Mm. The house gets its name Bacon's Castle from this explosive event called Bacon's Rebellion. Huge rebellion. So we're <laughs> talking like indentured servants of all races and genders, all banding together in a rebellion against the British governor. Hmm. Bacon led his rebellion against the colonial government in 1676. And 70 of his rebels took over this house and they d destroyed a lot of stuff. They drank all the wine and liquor and broke the bottles and butchered all the livestock and trampled the garden, ate all the crops and destroyed a lot of furniture. They were only here three months. They were chased away by British troops eventually. But when the rebels left, they took uh, 56 pillowcases. I don't know who has that many, but you know, obviously they're just filling them up with stuff to, oh, to run away with. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know what I'll get them. I know. I know. Hey, I'm this is so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been called Bacon's Castle ever since. <laughs> Interesting legacy. Yeah because the elites were terrified that that would happen again. They could see that it was a very real possibility, but not if you divide them against each other. Yeah. The aristocracy is thinking, and the government, you know, how do we prevent this from happening again? We don't want the lower class rising up against us. And um, so one way to prevent that is to not let people free after their indenture is up, but mm. keep them enslaved for life. And so we do see more race-based slavery and less indentured servitude after Bacon's Rebellion. And each, each generation, there were more enslaved people on the property. Mm. Um, up to when the Hankins were here, just before the Civil War, there were um, about 80. Wow. This is kind of a microcosm of the story of American slavery and how it becomes entrenched and how it's like race, class, and gender, and absolutely everything entangled mm. all together. It's, and she's like right in the middle of it, being told how to be a successful person. Hmm. That could turn you into a pretty hardened, <laughs> intimidating, <Yeah. laughs> terrifying <laughs> dowager countess personality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And she's even a dowager. Yeah. I mean, she, maybe she's completely fierce and scary at this point. But then she does a really, a thing I can't understand. Her second husband died, hmm. Arthur Smith, after 24 years of marriage. Hmm. And at age 68, she married again hmm. to a man, we only know his last name was Stiff. That's all we know. Maybe she's a sweet, loving lady. Yeah. Maybe know. she's lonely. <laughs> Maybe. So, and he didn't live too long, too much longer. So she outlived him. And she would go on to live to age 83, ruling over that house, inhabited by her daughter's family and grandchildren. Hmm. And she's overseeing her Smithfield school, and she's admiring her silver and deciding <laughs> who's going to get this spoon and who's going to get this cup. <laughs> and yeah. She was she was well respected, mostly. Although when she was older, 
one one um, book says she turned she was irascible and she was sued by a servant for ill treatment, and the servant did win. When she died, there was a notice in the Williamsburg newspaper of her death. But I sure had to rake through that thing like three times in order to find it. And it's just one hmm. little sentence, very unsentimental. Just hmm. the notice, the widow stiff has died. Wow. Nobody cared. Maybe she was perfectly delightful until she was 78 and got yeah. sick. And got dementia. And grouchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she left money to the Smithfield School that she established to the Lower South Work Parish of her church, to her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, godchildren, friends, and neighbors. In her will, she made it very clear she wanted no funeral, <laughs> just a, quote, decent burial in a plain black walnut coffin. Oh. So is that admirable biblical humility, or did she know that nobody would nobody go would to show her up. funeral? <laughs> Mm. Wow. Is the family buried here? Or we, somewhere? It's likely that they are just because that's kind of what they did then, but we don't know of any grave. The only graves we know of on the property are from the Hankins family, which is um, late 1800s. Oh, wow. So it's likely there are unmarked graves. If any woman would haunt this house, <laughs> it would be her. Yeah. We do get a lot of paranormal investigators through, too, you know. <laughs> what they say, I have to know. There was one story about, you know, you'd come in this room and the rocking chair would be rocking when no one had been here. Mm -hmm. um, in more recent days, a woman who was working here said she set up chairs in the room over there, and when she came back, the chairs were moved. And there's uh, one docent who about five years ago said she saw a lady in white at the top of the stairs. Probably the most famous story is the Bacon's Castle light. And it's been seen for a couple hundred years. There's different stories about how it started, but one is that there was a young girl who lived, servant girl who lived in the garret. And she was going across to the cemetery, which is less than a mile from here, half a mile, to meet her lover. And um, she came back and she went up the stairs and she was carrying a candle and she lit her hair on fire. And so she went running back to him for help and she perished on the way. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who say they've seen a fireball going across a field from the cemetery to the back stair tower. There's one story about a man who, he was working here during the restoration and um, he went in to see his child one night and the, the boy was laughing and he said, why are you laughing? And he says, the lady with white gloves is tickling me. Oh. And there was nobody else in there. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, yeah, children usually think up this mm -hmm. stuff, huh? Uh, <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The playing with children seems unlikely. Oh, that one. Is, yeah, except uh, that her young child died. And maybe she was delightful. It, maybe, maybe she was see? the nicest mom ever. See? And if she lost her young son, yeah. maybe that could have been the moment that she broke and became a hardened, terrible yeah, person. Yeah, lost two kids within be, a couple of years. Yep. She could be yearning for kids or searching for them. Mm. And actually, right after I visited Bacon's Castle, Ghost Hunters visited castle. It's kind of amazing to be in this house and think about families lived here for over 300 years and all the different people and all the different stories and all the different personalities. And there, there's so much history and so many layers of history. And when Preservation Virginia bought the property, they had to decide whether they were going to tear off the addition and return it to original condition, like the bedchamber we saw upstairs. But they decided to take the way of showing the, the changes through the years yeah. and how the house had housed so many different families and many different kinds of people through, through many different situations. Mm -hmm. There has been just so much regular life here. She 
stood up for herself. She was concerned about her family and she provided for her family in ways that took a strength that wasn't common in women at that time. And she also was concerned with the needs of people who didn't have as much as she had. She recognized that she was in a very unusual position and she shared what she had with others. I think about the codes that women live by in today's societies and all the boxes you can check mm. for like an Instagram worthy life, mm. you know? It's pretty much very clear. It's almost the same kind of checkbox of the things you gotta do. Mm -hmm. And you can win, you can be like, nailed it, I did all the things. <laughs> and in the end, where does that leave you? Mm. Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, <laughs> and Mondays during the summer. There we go. But we'd be happy to see you. Special thanks to Carol Weedle at Bacon's Castle in Surrey, Virginia. If you're in the area, definitely go and check it out. This interview was recorded on site by Shelby Durant and Madison Miles. Our interns are Livia Foley and Katie Boucher. Music for this episode was composed by Kevin McLeod, Brian Bolger, Late Night Feeler, Cooper Cannell, and Daniel Foster Smith. You can find lots of photos from my visit to the house, as well as links to all of this music in the show notes at whatshernamepodcast.com. And don't forget to click on tours if you're interested in coming with us to Mexico. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post all kinds of additional content each week. This is the final episode in Season 12. We will be back May 3rd with many more episodes of What's Her Name. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for donating. Thanks for listening. <laughs>